we got to solve this problem. We need everybody to come with us. And if we don't go together, we're doomed to fail. And it's time for us to win this war. All these conversations are great, but it's so we put this work into action. was even um, some opposition within California and uh, folks who weren't uh, necessarily on board. But tell us in the last minute that we have how, you know, I, I love this idea of we're going to push, push, push. And that's what we have to do. So how would you answer maybe some of the, the major points against us? Yeah, so to be clear, one of our strengths is we had a lot of corporate corporations that were supporting the bill in, in all sorts of different sectors. So we and and so when the other side, when the opposition would say this is impossible to implement or this is going to cost 14 quadrillion dollars, all of which was false, we could point to well, if Amalgamated Bank is doing it, and if all of these apparel and footwear companies are doing it, and if Apple is doing it, and if Microsoft and Dignity Health are doing it, then obviously it can be done and it's reasonable. Um, but we had the California Chamber of Commerce, the Western States Petroleum Association, the American Petroleum Association, the bankers. Just every few days there was a new piece of inaccurate information that, that they were spreading around, around the bill. Uh, and so, um, especially about scope three and, and just making things up and trying to confuse members. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues uh, for seeing through that and being willing to take a hard vote on the bill. And fundamentally, they were not actually concerned about implementation or cost because they knew that wasn't an issue. Uh, they were, they don't want to lift up the hood and actually show the public which corporations are walking the walk and which are actually just talking the talk. And they know some corporations will be embarrassed um, and they didn't want to admit that so they made up other uh, things. I do just also want to thank publicly Mary Nichols uh, from the formerly running the California Air Resources Board, who was a wonderful, wonderful resource and cheerleader for the bill. Well, Senator Weiner, we have to close there, but thank you for your leadership. Thank you for joining us here today. And um, I know there will be a lot more conversation about this to come. So thank you so much. Thank you. This uh, session, which is very short, was billed as a fireside chat. And I'm offering a prize here and now to anybody who will come up with an alternative to fireside chat, because we don't burn anything anymore, do we? <laughs> do we? <laughs> All right. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to be here today to introduce someone who um, is leading the charge at the federal level to do something very difficult, which is to implement two pieces of the policy of the Biden-Harris administration, which some people think are perhaps in contradiction with each other. And so we're going to probe that question a little bit. Um, First of all, I'll just ask you, since you are uh, obviously playing a key role as the chair of the uh, Council on Environmental Quality in implementing both the environmental uh, robust standards that this administration has, has worked for and also the expediting of clean energy projects, um, how do you make these two things happen at once? How do you navigate the tensions? First of all, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this issue, which I know is uh, front and center on many people's minds. I think, first of all, just stepping back a minute and, and recognizing that we have such a transformational opportunity at this point because of what the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law have afforded us in terms of being able to really change the clean energy economy. And so it's very important to the president, to everyone in the administration, that we are successful at actually doing projects, getting the projects built. And so this administration has been uh, laser focused from the beginning on trying to ensure that we have expedited permitting procedures, that we are organizing ourselves as a federal government in a way that allows us to coordinate and to deal with some of the um, 
hurdles that have existed in the past, but also it's really important that we are making sure that we're making smart decisions, decisions that really reflect what the environmental information is telling us, decisions that actually uh, take into consideration what uh, communities want and that we are engaging with communities. So that's, that's our anchor. And one of the things that the, Bi um, the Infl Inflation Reduction Act did that no other statute has done before is it actually gave us money for permitting. We got a billion dollars in that law for permitting. And so we are deploying that all across the government, both in terms of hiring staff, but also in having the technology that's necessary to help advance uh, our efforts. So to us, that these things all come together to make it possible, and we are seeing on the ground that projects are actually moving more quickly, that when agencies start off with engagement procedures that actually are implemented early and continue throughout the process, that in fact you have less issues, you also have less uh, trouble from the community. So uh, you've uh, identified a couple of the major uh, challenges in terms of technology adoption and policy hurdles that are embedded in many different laws and different levels of government. How do you see within these various complexities really the most important opportunities as well as the biggest challenges that you're facing? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the point is that we are, we are um, um, blessed to have an, uh, have an approach on our clean energy building that is very different than has happened before, right? We, we don't, we're not given money in one pot through a traditional grant programs. And so... Um, the system that IRA has created and then, you know, bolstered by the um, bipartisan infrastructure law really requires that we're working across the board, across sectors, that we're engaging um, people in ways that I don't think that other laws have required. And in some ways, that itself is its power. Uh, it's the op it's, it creates some obstacles for sure, but it's also its, its power. And I will say one thing that I want to just announce as a, a way to help people understand how serious we are about moving forward, you know, this summer the um, Fiscal Responsibility Act was passed. That was the first time that NEPA has actually been changed in statute. You know, there was some kerfuffle about that, but it did include a number of efficiency procedures. And uh, today, uh, DOT and DOE are announcing how they're already adopting efficiency measures that are going to help us streamline the projects. Uh, there's a, both uh, DOT is actually adopting a, an efficiency measure, which is called the categorical exclusion, that DOE has in its program. Uh, and similarly, an approach is being taken by Commerce adopting a DOE measure. And so we're already making sure that these things are happening on the ground. So we're, we're back to... Uh the days of reinventing government in some ways where we are getting out of our own way and trying to make things happen. Well, speaking of other important initiatives, I couldn't have you here without asking you about the Justice 40 initiative because that's another key yeah. element of the uh, policies of this administration. And uh, you are obviously uh, in yourself a, a role model here. Uh, but the goal was to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of federal clean energy as well as climate and other investments to directly to disadvantaged communities. Um, I take a certain amount of pride in the fact that this is where California had a leadership yes. role back a couple of years ago, but this is you're doing this in a whole different scale and with a whole lot more money. So I'd love to hear what you uh, can tell us at this point about any uh, tangible differences that you're seeing already for disadvantaged communities. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, state leadership matters, so I loved hearing the uh, discussion before because it does help to have those models out there. I guess what I would say, number one, is it's very important to both the president and the vice president that as we are moving into this new clean energy economy, that it is an economy that benefits all people, that we are looking for and focused on creating a just transition, and that's what Justice 40 is about. It's making sure that the clean air, the clean water, and the healthy community infrastructure that we've created for decades actually benefits everyone. And so what Justice 40 allows, this commitment of 40% to, um, to disadvantaged communities, is for us to make sure on the front end that we are um, uh, prioritizing where dollars are going. So as an example, last week I was in Iowa with Secretary Vilsack and, uh, where he was announcing a billion dollar program that is focused on 
um, making sure that trees are replaced because trees are a really important part of climate. They're an important part of reducing uh, temperatures in neighborhoods, and we know that there is a disproportionate um, uh, tree expanse within communities. And so for that program, they use the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, which is a tool we created to help identify who the disadvantaged communities are, to, to issue these grants. So 385 grants are being given all across the, the country, all 50 states, and they're all targeting communities that are under that grant. So that's one example. The electric vehicle um, program that uh, DO, um, that EPA mm -hmm. is doing, right, school buses, also is a great program. Um, I had the chance to be in Connecticut just a few months ago where there's a technical school there that actually helps uh, students to both understand how to, you know, work in this new economy, to have jobs in this new economy that was getting like 28 electric school buses that would be taking kids to and from school and it would also be taking them to and from their jobs. And all across the country, those kinds of prob programs are also being implemented. It's fun that you're able to be part of that. Oh, that, that is the best part. Actually, when you go into these communities and you hear the excitement and enthusiasm about the work, it is just wonderful. So the federal government itself is also tasked by the president and vice president with setting a gold standard yep. for sustainability practices, and that's no easy task, given the breadth and, in some cases, the age of buildings and other issues. So talk a little bit about ways in which you think the federal government itself could set a, be a model, really, of sustainability. Yeah, yeah. Again, another really important pro, um, area of our um, uh, portfolio where the president, again, is focused on our having, showing leadership. We're not only showing leadership internationally, we're showing leadership across the country and making sure that we ourselves are kind of walking the talk, right? And so, um, and he, the president created a um, sustainability executive order, uh, you know, in, early in the administration, which actually set the targets for the, for the agencies, for the federal government in terms of uh, EVs, in terms of energy, uh, in terms of our, um, eventually having a net zero operations. That's a 2050 goal that we're all working towards. And so all of these things are actually influencing the, the work that we're doing. There's a Buy Clean initiative that's very important in the uh, administration, which uh, allows us to be focused on uh, materials, having materials that are um, have less carbon in them and mm -hmm. steel and asphalt and glass. Um, and that is something that we're doing again, and we're doing in partnership with state and local governments, where those, they're also working towards uh, this goal. Another place is buildings, right? So we issued a um, federal building standard, perform performance standard. And so again, all across the government, we are really focused on reducing the, the carbon, uh, carbon in buildings, changing the energy practices, installing heat pumps, uh, you know, changing our en energy mix. and. Uh, just a couple of months ago, we had an announcement at Ronald Reagan, which is the largest federal building in D.C., uh, and it is one of at least 100 buildings all across the country in which these actions are being taken. And so another exciting thing that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> okay, I, I am being told that okay. I have to wrap up this conversation, wrap. which I would love to continue, but... Um, I, I have to ask you, uh, on a personal level, the dreaded legacy question. <laughs> but, you know, as the first African-American chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, uh, you do get to be a role model and to set precedents uh, just by virtue of being there, yeah. doing the job. Um, so when you think about where you want to see things at, after you leave, you know, what is the most important thing that you would really like to leave behind? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I, legacy, really hard thing to even focus on, but I do think just presence matters, and I've seen that, especially when I'm in schools, when I go across the country, I'm talking to students, their excitement to know that they could be me. That's real, and they talk about it, and they talk about it when they're nine and they're 10, and so I actually take that quite seriously. I think for me personally, we have a president who's already shown his interest in conservation legacy, and so we are on track to have a very substantial president in terms of what we are able to accomplish on conservation. Um, I would love to be the person who establishes that permitting a program that shows that you can actually uh, have fast, efficient uh, projects and approaches at the same time that we're protecting the environment and we're protecting people. Uh, so those are two things that I would lift up. That's terrific. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today.
Thank you. Thanks. Great conversation. Uh, I'm Bill Ritter, Chair of the Board for the Climate Group North America, and I'm going to introduce my panel now. Folks will come up. Christine Harada, she's at the Office of Budget and Management as a Senior Advisor on Federal Procurement. Pedro Pizarro, President and CEO of Edison International. Sarah Chandler, VP of Environment and Supply Chain Innovation at Apple. She says she did not pick her own title. Um, Senator Harry Stern from California represents Ventura County and LA County, and Tommy Boudreau, the Deputy Secretary of Interior. That's our panel. Come on up, folks. <laughs> Turn a little bit so I can see y'all. Are we shy a chair? It's a musical chair. Oh. <laughs> I think maybe you're supposed to double buckle there, boys. There you go. Does everybody have a microphone too? Now you do. Okay. So um, this is an important conversation, really a follow-on to the conversation with Mary and Brenda about everything that the federal government has tackled. Um, but it, whether it's a federal issue or a state or a local issue, here's what we know. In order to get to the kind of goals that have been set by utilities, by the power sector, we're going to have to triple the pace at which we're building out renewables uh, over the next seven or eight years, and then we're going to have to quadruple the pace again by 2050 to really get to where we're going. That's a daunting task if you think about all that's going to be required of that. And one of the issues around that is how do you deploy that? How do you deploy renewables and storage at that scale? How do you build the transmission out? How do you do it on private land? How do you do it on public land? And we've got this panel of experts that are going to help us think about that. So the first question is really a question that I want everybody to answer. We've got, I think, 44 minutes, it says here. That's good. That's better than I thought. Um, so we've got 45 minutes to talk about this. But just take a couple of minutes uh, from your own perspective. Christine, I'm going to start with you and just ask you um, this question. I want to make sure I get it right for everybody. Um, could each of you briefly describe what you see as the most pressing action to accelerating the deployment of clean energy projects? What's the sort of the thing you would prioritize from your perspective in deploying clean energy projects around the United States? Well, so thank you so much, firstly, for having me here. And it's an excellent question because depending on your role, there's so many different things that you can do. Um, I've had the good fortune of having served as a Chief Sustainability Officer for the federal government. I was also recently head of or organizing a lot of the permitting efforts. And currently right now, as I sit in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, I am a buyer. So with my most recent hat on, there's a lot of work that we could be, should be doing and are doing with respect to actually sending the signal out to the markets. We are putting in regulations and rules that signal that we are very serious about buying renewable energy, ensuring and holding corporations accountable for decarbonizing their own operations, et cetera, um, as well as entering into contracts. Many agencies are entering into PPAs for procuring clean energy. Of course, we have the power marketing authorities that are also working on this as well. Um, and so in our current role, again, very much is around ensuring that we're sending that signal to the market. We are serious. We're here to buy. We've got you know, dollars against various contracts, et cetera. With my previous hat on from a permitting perspective, and I'm sure Tommy will talk to this a lot more in depth than I will, but as Brenda just mentioned as well, we are putting in place a lot of the effort and the infrastructure on our end to ensure that we're able to permit these projects and get them built, steel on the ground, concrete in the ground, boots in the ground as quickly as possible to ensure that we're actually being able to deliver on these key projects. Thanks. And so I had the real benefit of working with a group of power sector CEOs uh, and with environmental NGOs for a couple of years. Pedro was one of them, and you would really regard him as kind of one of the good kids in the class. Uh, when you talk about utility CEOs and the things that they're trying to do to really move the ball forward. So Pedro, from your experience as a CEO of a major utility, do you have a priority that you have in mind as a way to move forward the deployment of clean energy projects? Uh, th thanks, Bill, and it's great being here. I'll pick up where Christine left off, permitting and siding. So when you think about the so signals... Permitting and citing? And citing. Okay. Permitting and citing. 
when you think about the signals that the federal government has, has sent, they're terrific, right? We have the IRA, we have IIJA, we have the Chips and Science Act. So a lot of investment flowing into the economy. The challenge is getting that steel in the ground. Today, when you think about the grid, right? You know, my peer uh, uh, companies across the uh, Edison Electric Institute, which I chair this year, you know, last year we invested $150 billion in the U.S. economy for the power sector. $30 billion of that was for transmission. So money's flowing, but it takes 10 to 12 years to build a transmission line, if you're lucky. Actually, it takes about two years to build a transmission line. It takes a lot of years to get permitting and siding. Um, we've had some progress at the federal level, and the Fiscal Responsibility Act included some reforms to the NEPA process, which are helpful. In my home state of California, credit to the state legislature, because they now have a number of bills on the governor's desk that will significantly help with uh, permitting and siding authority as well. But this is a critical one. And this morning, my company released our latest white paper. Uh, it's called Countdown to 2045. It's looking at how California, the whole economy, not just us, can get to net zero by 2045. And I'll give you one sound bite from that paper. But given the amount of grid that will be needed to connect renewables and storage with places to be electrified in the economy, the pace of transmission development will have to quadruple relative to historical levels. The pace of distribution wire development, and the more local stuff, will have to be tenfold what it's been historically. So permitting and siting, I think, is going to be the, the real bottleneck that we need to continue to work on. Some progress, but more help needed. Thanks, Pedro. Sarah, so as a representative of Apple, and Apple has been out front on this issue for a very long time, I know both on the project side and the transmission side, do you guys have like a priority in mind for what is the number one thing to accelerate this deployment? Yeah, I, I think I'd say scale at quality. Uh, I come from a supply chain background, so that's always forefront in my mind, but uh, you've, you've probably seen the recent news that uh, Apple announced our first carbon neutral products last week. A big part of that was renewable energy. So getting suppliers to run on renewable energy, getting them signed up for renewable energy, we were able to cover the entire manufacturing energy load through Apple and our suppliers with investments uh, and sourcing in renewables. Now we need to do all the products, so we need scale. Um, we need this to move faster, um, and we need it to move globally. Um, it's, it's something that we've seen a lot of positive trends in. We've got a lot of traction there. We have a lot of suppliers signing up, but we need them to actually be able to run on renewable faster. Everybody in New York this week feels the urgency to take these issues on and to move it forward. For what it's worth, for in my view, and I've served in the Obama administration, I've served in the Biden administration, this administration across the board has shown a greater degree of urgency and seriousness on attacking these problems, including on the demand side, that's what Bill and IRA are all about, and including on the permitting side. All of the deployment we're talking about is to dismantle the architecture built over the last 150 years to support fossil fuel development. So I understand the passion and I apologize for the disruption. I don't wanna you know, have my presence interrupt um, important conversations, but I also appreciate um, the passion everyone has around all of this. I have a uh, 20 year old and a 20 and an 18 year old um, they asked me straight up hard questions too, like what is the world going to look like in 2050? Are we screwed? And my answer is um, we've got to mobilize every resource in our command uh, in order to head off that potentially very dismal future. And so I don't take offense. Um, I wish folks you know, would um, allow space for uh, the serious conversations that um, have to happen in order to advance in the way we are, but um, the kids are right. Hey, Bill, could, could I chip yeah, in? Yeah, go here? ahead. Because there's another part to this. It's, we are all pushing hard to get to that net zero point, and it's so vital to the economy, and it's vital to the planet. And it's about climate change mitigation. We also need to deal with climate change adaptation. At the same time, we need to be pragmatic about you know, and I feel for governors, I feel for legislators, I feel for the president. You're balancing the economy. 
right? And so the transition needs to be real, it needs to get to net zero, but it also needs to be reliable and affordable, and it needs to take into account the real current status of the technology development. So I applaud the federal government, for example, for the massive infusion of capital into the economy through the tax credits in the IRA and the IIJA and CHIPS Plus. Uh, but you know, I also recognize that it's gonna take all of the tools and we do not have perfect foresight sitting here in 2023 as to which technologies are really going to mature quicker versus slower, right? And so I'll give you one example, and you know, Senator Stern brought this one up. In our home state of California, Aliso Canyon, gas storage, you know, my company is electric only, right? So we don't have a dog in the gas hunt. But we do use gas, right? And, and the power suppliers who are keeping, helping keep the lights on in California today, there's still about, I don't know, 40% or so that are burning gas. Over the long run, we understand that that needs to decline, right? Some portion of that may still need to run in order to keep reliability and affordability um, supported by carbon capture, right? I cannot tell you with perfect foresight today, right, what's gonna be the perfect mix in 2045. I can't tell you that as a state and as a country, we need to continue to invest in the technologies, we need to continue to make the commitments, and then we also need to continue to be flexible, keep as many options open as possible, because we need to do this in a way that's not going to tank the economy either. And so that's a struggle, you know, and Henry mentioned, you know, EEI, my colleagues across the country, they're in red states or in blue states or in purple states, whatever other shade color you have in there. They're all committed to the transition. As an industry, we beat the targets in the Obama Clean Power Plan, which got thrown out by courts. And so as we're looking forward, we wanna make sure we're investing in te technologies, we're supporting good regulation, we're supporting good regulation that will be durable, that will not get thrown out by the courts. Um, and we just want to advance this thing and, and again, got to keep some flexibility, keep the options open, and be pragmatic. It's such a tension because it is about flexibility, but uh, I think to your point, Sarah, it's also about speed and scale that we have to do it very quickly. And we, you know, the power sector has not been known for, for being speedy. It's been known for its ability to scale, to be reliable, affordable over time. Now sustainability has entered into the lexicon in a different way. And so really, how do we do it at the speed and the scale that we need to do? If you think about just even your own point about the build out of transmission has to be 4X the pace it's been. And Sarah. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to jump in. So I mean, I think it's it, the role of business here can be quite impactful because it, you can say where you're going uh, and hope that everyone runs fast enough <laughs> to get there by the time you need them to be there. So it's pretty unusual for Apple to say exactly what we are doing and how and by when, but that's what we've done. We're gonna be carbon neutral by 2030 and everything needs to be running on renewable energy in order to meet that goal for decarbonization. That means we need a lot of scale and we need it quickly and we can help that in a variety of ways. So two of the big ways are education of our suppliers. Our hope is not just to get ourselves to run on renewable energy, we actually already do that. Um, we wanna get our suppliers running on renewable energy, not just for our load, but for their other customers as well so that everyone can benefit. That involves a lot of education. So we create tools for them. We have a supplier, Clean Energy Academy. We have tools they can log into and see in the grids that they're in, what are their options. And then when the options aren't as good as they need to be in those grids, we can engage in advocacy. And so we can partner with our suppliers to go together and advocate for affordable, accessible, renewable power um, in all of the places in the world that we need it. And so we'll, we'll continue to do that. You've seen us do that um, in places like Japan. With the, we were the first non-Japanese company in the Japan Climate Leaders Partnership. And we'll continue to partner locally and at the federal level. I, I will say that we obviously supported SV253. Um, I think disclosure is a big part of this. Um, but we need, to, we need to move faster and we need to do it together. Um, and one great way to do that is for companies to say exactly what they need and by when. So, um, Christine, I'm gonna come back to you. It feels to me um, in a state like Colorado and around the West, there's some growing organized opposition to the siting of renewables and siting of transmission. Uh, county commissions have a lot of responsibility in a lot of states, and we see, like, at the local level, people showing up that weren't showing up five and ten years ago. Um, so how do, we, how do we manage that conversation? And really, in some respects, it's more of a political conversation than it's really a policy conversation. For sure, and there's a lot of, like, both big P as well as little P political conversations that do need to happen, and it's one of my viewpoints that 
you know, this is where building on what Brenda was talking about earlier, very active engagement early and often. And what does that engagement actually look, what does engagement actually really mean? It's one-on-one, -on -one, person to person. It's conversations in the households with your kids, with your neighbors, with the people in the Facebook groups that may have tremendously different views from you know, what you have. There's also a fairly significant amount of disinformation and misinformation out there that is rather malignant in Christine's personal view that you know, we all could be, should be doing more to help with countering around that. Um, learning techniques ourselves with how do we think about persuading other folks um, I'm an engineer by training, uh, and I like to think of myself as a rather rational person. But only maybe a third of us are all that kind of rational, but we are 100% emotional. So how do we think about having those kinds of emotional conversations and connecting with folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis? And that is super hard to do at scale. I think for a lot of us, it's gonna be a retail little p politics kind of effort. I also think that there's a significant amount that both investments in economics and financials and ensuring that the money pencils out can really play a role in this. And I think that you know, for those folks in the room who work with the bankers and the asset managers and the investment managers, if I could convince you to please continue to have those conversations with the folks who are putting the money behind these projects to think differently about how they want to manage the risks of these investments. I think it's great. We have got two great examples here of corporations that are looking at those risks and asking those more thoughtful questions for the bankers, et cetera, in the room that really provide a lot of that financing, whether it be all sorts of different kinds of color of capital, credit facilities, et cetera. How do you think differently about managing the risks? What kind of questions should you be asking and how do you do that also on a little p retail politics level within that particular industry? Yeah, and, and Tell Governor, me. if I could weigh in on, on that set of issues, too. Um, one of the, and again, when you think about sort of the structural barriers to energy transition, um, one of the most significant ones that, um, that we run into, uh, and it's a political issue uh, as much as anything, is on the revenue side. And so one of the legacies and consequences of uh, energy development in this country based on fossil fuels has been many of our states and many of our communities, especially out west, are intertwined with fossil fuel development because of revenue sharing structures. And so it is fundamental to how many communities provide basic services, including education, emergency services, um, from oil and gas revenue. And as long as that circumstance is not paralleled on the renewable energy side where communities don't see themselves as closely tied to renewable energy development, that's where we run into a lot of these very challenging politics where it does feel like something's being taken away without being replaced. And that is a very, and obviously like how revenues work on renewable energy is very different than fossil fuel development, but that's a very serious conversation we need to have across the country. Otherwise, it is gonna be very difficult to convince, you know, towns and states um, uh, that, you know, this transition we're talking about will be a just one and you can still, you know, fund schools, keep people uh, in the communities and keep, you know, ways of life going. Uh, that doesn't happen overnight and sometimes you end up signing things that make people upset and, you know, resource development states like Alaska, but that has to be solved for. Otherwise, you know, the politics, um, I think, uh, give, just get really challenging. So Senator, um how does community engagement look, and especially in the IRA with, as we referred to earlier, marginalized communities? Um, a tribe, by definition, is marginalized, and so every uh, reservation in America as a community can benefit from the Justice 40 um, revenue that flows. How do you, in public office, think about how to best engage communities and maybe remove some of the resistance or some of the barriers? The, the, the end of the, the answer is two documents, but the, the process of, to get there is tricky. So more community benefits agreements, and in my view, more collective bargaining agreements. So if you have, and ideally project labor agreements. In other words, if you can get organized labor and you can get 
communities that would not naturally feel it's table to actually understand the process and do that in advance. And thank God the White House has that foresight. The billion dollars on Justice 40 and community engagement just went out this week ahead of all the money we're gonna to try to get out the door on transmission, ahead of all the money we're gonna to try to get out the door on generation. Getting that money out ahead and building capacity that are authentic to the community. This isn't a national NGO strategy that's gonna work, right? What, what it feels like in Montana is gonna feel very different than what it feels like in you know, northern Arcata and you know, Blue Lake Rancheria out in California, and it's gonna, and it's gonna look different than you know, even to our Western partners, right? What's standing between us and a broader partnership at a state-by-state -state level to actually engage on climate like we so desperately need and in some ways like the power sector is being sort of forced into this box of plant by plant. And what it should really be is regional partnerships where emissions and carbon are sort of part of the formula. But that's the high level. Right on the ground, it's helping communities get good information and putting money into that so it doesn't just have to be people sort of you know, scraping along who otherwise wouldn't be at the table. And then you get durable agreements. Then you get, then you get fast permitting. Then things go fast because everyone says, no, I like this. And that general, the vibe, I don't know how to put it, right? Mm -hmm. But people want to say yes. And you don't have to force it down people's throats. It can be a yes on a high voltage transmission line through a habitat corridor. Uh, it, that can be done, we, well, we have to, but there's a way to do it that feels like victory to people. So Pedro, I'm gonna ask you the same thing because you and I have had these discussions personally about community engagement and really also about you know, marginalized communities and environmental justice issues around some of your customer base. How does a major utility try and strike that balance to do what's right for all your customers, but also actively engage communities that may feel left behind? Yeah, that's a great question and a lot of different ways. Um, it's so vital. Uh, I'll start with this. As we think about different programs that we develop, we can't be thinking about engaging the community when we have an answer and then having them check a box. They need to be involved in the development of that. So if you look at an example at Southern California Edison, we have our Charge Ready you know, program for uh, helping deploy electric, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, 400 plus million dollar program, about half of that is going to low income and the disadvantaged communities. And those communities were involved in the design of the program. Uh, SE has a nearly $700 million uh, billion, uh, million dollar application uh, for uh, building electrification. And so that also was designed with those communities, not only in mind, but at the table, at the design phase, right? Because we can't come up with something in the ivory tower. Uh, we really need to be doing it from the ground up. Uh, I also think that for us, the advocacy around making sure that more and more of the funds go to those who need the help the most has been critical. And my favorite example is if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, one little piece of it is a used electric vehicle tax credit, $4,000 per vehicle. Doesn't sound like a lot. It is a lot when you're thinking about a low income or disadvantaged person who might be getting not a, a high-end Tesla model or something, but they're gonna be getting a second or third hand bolt. Um, that's going to be as important to the transition as anything else, right? And then making sure that we're backing that up with the charging infrastructure to make sure it, you know, it's available in those communities. Uh, the final thought I'd give you, Bill, is that this is a conference on climate, so we're focused on CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not just about that, right? And the co-benefits of these measures, there's other environmental co-benefits and there's economic co-benefits. On the environmental side, the same things that we're doing around electrification for climate have a huge impact on air quality. And so as I think about you know, my, my home city of LA or Southern California, and you think about it, so what is it, something like 40% of the um, trade flowing through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, all that stuff gets transported today in diesel trucks going out to cities like Ontario, cutting through uh, a whole uh, range of disadvantaged communities, and they're the ones who are sucking up all the pollutants that are getting left behind, not just CO2, right? So electrifying the transport is going to have these great air quality benefits. Uh, then economics, I'll close on that. As we uh, you know, put out our, our countdown to 2045 white paper, one of the uh, insights that our analysis revealed was that 
the transition is expensive. It's going to need investment. And so we see California needing to invest something like $370 billion, billion. between now, billion, you know, big, big B, right? Uh, between now and 2045, just for the renewables resources, storage, the bulk power level, and, and all the grid to support that. However, when you take a look at the end result in 2045, although you know, the average household in Southern California Edison territory will be seeing a higher electric bill because there's some rate impact from that, and there's also we'll be using a lot more electricity. Because the electric technologies we'll be using are so much more efficient than fossil fuel technologies. You know, an electric motor in a car is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. Uh, a heat pump is more efficient than a gas water heater. Their total energy use, the cost of that, add up gasoline plus natural gas plus electricity, 40% lower in real terms than it is today. So there's a big economic co-benefit for communities. The electric bill may appear higher, but 40% less. Um, Get a look at the total energy yeah. bill and the share of wallet going towards that, and that's going down thanks to the efficiency. So, Christine, you know, there was a lot of work done on the Inflation Reduction Act. When it was first published and I read it, I thought, you know, of all the transitions I've witnessed in my life, this is one where the energy transition and an economic transition has the potential to not leave people behind because we've left a lot of people behind as we have developed as a society. Um, just if you could talk a little bit about the thinking inside the administration that went into Justice 40 maybe as part of the campaign, but then really executed in the IRA and what the real hope is there for marginalized communities. Sure, absolutely. And I think, you know, having, ensuring... You know, when the president ran for office, he committed to climate equity, racial equity, social justice, and there are a number of, these are very fundamental pillars for both his campaign as well as the administration, and it is not just lip service. This is something that we see every day, day in, day out in our operations within the administration, both from a policymaking side, as well as the operations and execution of our mission uh, and providing delivery to, uh, service and delivery to the American people perspective. A lot of the work that we've been doing around you know, we've been charged in our respective areas to think through very seriously how do we want to think about equity? What's, what does equity and procurement really look like? In our case, a lot of it is around ensuring that we are developing the small business communities. They are absolutely the backbone of a lot of our communities throughout the United States. How do we think about increasing the number of minority-owned, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses that serve not just the federal government but the overall communities as well? We are doing our best as we possibly can to ensure that we are fighting against um, some, in our opinion, relatively unfavorable case laws recently being made. There's a whole bunch of court rulings that are just uh, complete anathema to, I think, a lot of the principles that this nation is founded upon and ensuring that we're able to do that and execute on it in a really good, solid way forward. Uh, a lot of the tools that we're putting out to ensure that we are working with agencies, the climate justice equity tool, we have also a procurement equity tool. We are harvesting the data that we've got within the federal government to ensure that we're bringing that analysis to the fore. We're engaging with the public with respect to like a lot of data campaigns or uh, those types of activities and like open sourcing activities, if you will, to ensure that we're collecting the best and brightest ideas from our nation to make sure that we're actually bringing those solutions down. And certainly last but not at least, as Senator Stern also stated, ensuring that we are uh, putting our, our money where our mouth is by putting in community benefit agreements, project labor agreements, ensuring that that is in our procurement and our operations and all of our permitting decisions, leasing decisions. That is how we're executing that in the administration. So, Tommy, it's a follow-on question because, as I alluded to before, tribes are, by definition, in the act a marginalized community. I think one of the biggest environmental justice examples I've ever had was the Navajo generating station where it was the biggest coal-fired generating station in the West, I believe, and there were people who lived on the reservation under the power lines who had no electricity to their home. So now we have this chance to redo that. We have a chance to rebuild with renewables and a deployment of renewables and transmission, and they are, in fact, you know, marginalized communities. How's Interior thinking about that as part of your responsibility in the transition? Yeah, it's a... Uh it's a really key issue, and for all the reasons you said, Governor, um, tribal nations and tribal communities are uh, a really sort of bellwether lens through which to view uh, how we're approaching the energy transition and equity. Um, so 
part of the promise from my point of view that um, renewable energy and energy transition holds is to bring uh, tribes into uh, the opportunities in a way that historically uh, they were excluded from. And so there are great examples um, out west of tribes um, leading the charge on renewable energy development, taking advantage of resources they have either on the reservation or through you know businesses and partnerships uh, to take advantage of you know siting and generation. So that's a very key part of it. Another key part, not you know because I think these things are all related and we haven't touched on that much is, uh, supply chain and critical minerals, for example. And so one of the legacies that um, the U.S. carries with it is uh, a legacy of mining and hard rock mineral development um, that, um, that has disproportionately impacted tribal communities. And so Colorado is dotted with uh, abandoned uh, mines, uh, the entire West is. That pollution, that consequence is disproportionately borne by tribal communities. And so just last week, uh, we put out a report that, you know, the administration has been working on for a year and a half about uh, responsible sourcing of critical minerals necessary to support the energy transition and technology transitions that we're going through. That includes nickel and lithium and cobalt. Um, and how to do that in a way that um, uh, is respectful of, but more than that, brings tribal communities into, um, into the opportunities presented by it. That is, you know, when we talk about, you know, transitions and new ways of doing things and overcoming historical mindsets, that is going to be a huge undertaking. And, you know, the fact is, you know, for those of you who don't know, this country still operates its management of hard rock minerals, critical minerals, under a statute from the Grant Administration, the right. 1972 mining law. And one that inhibits efficient um, sourcing um, because um, it's literally a prospecting statute where you know folks just like they did in the 19th century run around staking claims, um, but it also carries this legacy of theft from tribal lands. And so um, that is another key component where for a bunch of reasons, including fueling the energy transition, but also uh, seeing a more just and equitable future, we need reform in that area. Otherwise, we're going to continue to be reliant on um, sourcing from uh, parts of the world that uh, are not reliable, uh, to put it euphemistically. Thanks. So uh, closing question, we have about five minutes left, and we'll just go down the line here, uh, starting with you, Senator. And it's um, a key takeaway from your thinking about this, what's the one thing government and industry could do a better job of in thinking about how we deploy renewables at speed and scale? Some new politics that give space for ostensibly warring sides to actually all say yes. I, I don't know what those new politics look like, but I know that our partners at the federal level and in the private sector here can uniquely make space for where states can't get out of their own way, where a ca how can California possibly be not seen as self-important to Colorado, and yet we need to link. New Mexico, we need that Sun Zia line. You know, Wyoming, we want that wind. How do we integrate through a new kind of politics? And I, I'm heartened to be on this panel. There's so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah? You know, I, th I think we're here to show what's possible, to show that this can work, uh, to show that this is absolutely doable. So uh, when we look at, at our transition to renewable energy for ourselves, now for our suppliers, for the whole supply chain, I think if we all partner together, we can, we can move a lot faster. And also lean into the narrative that not just can businesses do this, but this is actually good for business. Um, Amy, I'll use us as an example. We have lowered our carbon footprint by 45% since 2015, and our revenue has increased 65%.
So let's stop with the narrative that there's a trade-off between good for business and good for the economy. There's not. You can do both. Thank you. Pedro? Sense of urgency. Um, and we see it, right? Uh, we see voter polls where there's more and more awareness about the need to address climate. Uh, we have a, another business, Edison Energy, which is serving corporate clients of so a quarter of the Fortune 100. They have a sense of urgency. But when it then comes down to actually putting the steel in the ground, getting the transmission line built, getting that permit, you know, obviously we need to have a process where stakeholders can make their voices known. But at some point we have to understand that there are going to be trade-offs, right? And the greatest challenge we face is dealing with climate. So we need to accept that there's going to be some trade-offs around it, and then we got to move uh, because time's running out. Thank you. Christine. Thinking creatively and really opening the aperture to how you approach solving your respective problems in your industries, your fields. Uh, and by that specifically, you know, in the past, per perhaps we hadn't thought about project labor agreements. We hadn't thought about actually crafting community benefit agreements. So opening up the aperture to include all of those issues, whether they be climate justice, labor justice, et cetera, and then diving down deeper into those specific details. How do I actually structure a community benefits agreement? How do I engage with labor unions? If we're not a union state, how do we do prevailing wage? Opening the aperture and then double clicking, triple clicking into those areas is something I think we all desperately need. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah, and we've touched on, on all of it, I think. Um, from a technical standpoint, I think advanced planning um, and deconfliction process to um, accelerate permitting. There aren't any shortcuts around it. We live in a legit, litigious society. Um, that's not all bad. Um, but if we don't um, have um, serious and rigorous and streamlined ways to uh, do deconfliction and permitting up front, um, you may, you know feel good about approving something, but it won't actually get constructed. And uh, that is, after all, what uh, we're all in it for. Uh, and so, yeah, we do need um, uh, accelerated processes. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Give them a hand for a fantastic panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody still standing has to pay for everyone else's drinks tonight. Just saying. It's about to be a wild and crazy party if they don't sit down over there. You know, Climate Week NYC parties are the best parties out here, just saying. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. Come on now. Come on. 
We, we, we are here to, to have a, a good time while we learn and while we grow and while we build. My name is Michael Blake, uh, Bronx, New York native, uh, founder and CEO of Atlas Strategy Group. We've been in existence for 10 years. We help implement e equity and justice programs across the country, uh, and it has been a blessing with that. I'm a former New York Assembly member as well uh, for six years and a former vice chair of the DNC, so we've been keeping busy. Everyone, you can take as many photos as you want of me. That's okay right there. No, you know, uh, totally fine. We got great lighting. It really helps my dark skin right now. I'm very happy about that good lighting right there. We, we gonna get things going here. Uh, I'm going to ask for each of our panelists to come up and join me at this time. We obviously can see their names on up, so I'm going to ask for Katie, Maria, Ruben, and Will to come on up at this time. Let's give them all a round of applause, everybody. Come on, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. The, the, the purpose of us being here today is to be very intentional uh, on how are we implementing change and making change real uh, itself. And, and so this conversation uh, is going to focus primarily and heavily on best practices uh, and really leaning in on challenges and opportunities uh, around some of this game-changing uh, legislation that is providing funding all across our country here. Uh, very briefly, uh, we encourage people to be engaged, uh, and at the end, we'll only have, probably have time for about three questions at the most from the audience, uh, so make sure you have an outstanding one if you're getting teed up here uh, itself. Uh, Senator Carla, I always give acknowledgement on titles, whether former or current in that manner. Uh, Ruben Carla is the founder of Earth Finance and former Washington State Senator. Uh, Will Hazlitt, president of National Grid Ventures of the Northeast. Uh, Katie Yaroslavsky, Councilwoman out of Los Angeles, District 5, uh, and then Maria Kozlowski. They wanted to give me all the hard names, but I was ready. I came prepared right now. <laughs> Senior VP of Rockefeller Foundation, me and my hard name of Michael Blake right now, you know, making it very difficult here. Uh, and so we, we have an opening question out the gate. I'm going to also give this, let it be a space for you to give a 30 second of what you are doing in your current work as well um, here. What, what, what happened to the back screen? I just turned around. Of course, the brother gets up and everything goes all haywire right now. What is going on? What, there was a whole screen behind us. Yeah, I got upset. I started talking about paying for drinks and y'all turned the screen down. Well, you can see it on both sides here. So we'll, we'll keep this going until we get going there uh, itself. So we're going to start. We're going to ask every person to answer this opening question as difficult as it may be, in one sentence, not one paragraph, one sentence, can you summarize the most critical obstacle that you are facing? My most critical obstacle are the screens behind me right now <laughs> that are going up and down. It's like a bad night at a club right here, right now. It's a challenge out here. Can you summarize one critical obstacle your organization or jurisdiction is facing in implementing the Inflation Reduction Act? I'll start to my right and we'll go on down. Yeah, I, I'd say the biggest obstacle for us is navigation for our partners. You know, uh, IRA's got a lot of programs. The Treasury, other agencies come out with things every week and for our community level partners, knowing the how, when, which programs to apply to, that's, uh, that's what we see is where we should be intervening. And, and give some perspective, and, and as it relates to Rockefeller, like how the connection in the work. Yeah, so for us, the Rockefeller Foundation, we're one of the oldest, perhaps the oldest philanthropy in the U.S. We are highly focused in our U.S. Um, economic equity program to make sure the Justice 40 goals are met in the communities that we serve. And so for us, this right now is helping um, joint partnerships work with peer philanthropies to provide support that enables community-based organizations, local governments, state-level um, organizations really navigate 
this funding because at the end of the day, I mean, this is where the funding is on the table right now and it's on the table for climate. I think tied to that is community development and that's where we're trying to operate. Uh, Councilwoman, I'm sure you have a few things happening in Los Angeles uh, to help implement uh, this work. You know, in one sentence, initially give context of the most critical challenge and then lean a little bit about your district so people can understand that as well, please. Thank you. Um, so along the same lines, you know, capacity building is really hard. The city of Los Angeles, like most big cities around the country right now, is, is still coming out of COVID. Staffing levels are still wildly low. And so for us to be proactively going after this money, for all the reasons that you just talked about, uh, has been more challenging than it should be. Uh, and then, you know, broadly speaking, um, I was elected to the Los Angeles City Council in, in November of last year, so I'm, I'm one of five new council members. Come on, give a round of applause right there, right there. Congratulations and condolences. Exactly. Uh, the council's got 15 members. Each of us represents almost 200,000 people. Uh, we've got a new mayor, Mayor Karen Bass. I'm yeah. here representing the city of L.A. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the biggest crisis we're facing right now is the city beyond climate, which is the number one crisis for all of us, is, is homelessness and deep poverty. And so um, I'm honored to chair the city's Energy and Environment Committee, which oversees LADWP, which is the largest municipal utility in the country. Uh, and so I'm really using that as an opportunity to push progress or, or trying to figure out how to crack that nut. I also sit on Metro, which is our regional transportation authority as a representative of the city of Los Angeles and appointee of the mayor. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here representing LA. Absolutely, and, and we have to always recognize the intersectionality of transportation and energy and climate. They're all intertwined uh, for many reasons. Uh, Will, uh, most challenging obstacle, uh, and then a little bit about your organization for context as well. Sure, and I'll actually start at the end. National Grid is a large utility holding company. National Grid Ventures is the unregulated division or the, the vision that operates outside of the regulated utilities. We're focused on developing, owning, and operating large-scale energy infrastructure that's absolutely critical for delivering the energy transition. So that's onshore renewables and offshore wind. And those are two of the categories of big beneficiaries for tax credits in the IRA. But the biggest challenge is access to the grid, being able to connect those uh, generation facilities to the grid. So we spend quite a bit of time uh, focusing our efforts on how do we get better planning in place uh, to deliver the, the grid that's needed for renewables to connect. We could have a whole conversation about regulations as well. That can be a it's panel in its own regard. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, Senator, uh, most challenging obstacle uh, that you're seeing in your current work uh, and in perspective as well, uh, current and former, because obviously uh, as, as a New Yorker, we always try to say we had the gold standard for environmental legislation, but state of Washington um, regularly uh, has been able to hold that, that mantle. So please. Thank you. This is the biggest economic and societal transition in global history. We have 27 years to reach 2050. And 27 years ago, we didn't have commercial availability really of mobile phones and the internet. We can do this. But in the previous conversations this morning, we started at the 50,000 foot level, the 20,000, and now we're down to the real deal impact of real people living real lives. And the challenge of implementation that everyone has mentioned goes to the heart and soul of how incredibly difficult it is uh, to evolve away from a fossil fuel based system. I think you have the 1% of really premier companies that have committed to net zero, have committed to decarbonization, and you've got 99% of everyone else who's really struggling to figure out how do you do this and how do you implement it. Uh, for me, uh, I was the chair of the Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee of the Washington State Senate when we passed the strongest climate legislation in the United States. Uh, we're the, uh, one of the few governments in the world with binding enforceable commitments to Paris Agreement, uh, and we're on track the only state in the nation on track to reach 2030 Paris goals. But it's painful, it's difficult, it's challenging. It takes deep science, deep politics, a deep understanding of community impact. And there was a previous comment, uh, comment uh, about um, the electrification of transportation. Those trucks roll through communities of color and disproportionately impacted communities every day. 
yet getting those trucks, tens of thousands, converted to electric infrastructure, it's an unbelievable challenge, technically, operationally, and financially. That's the real world affecting real people living real lives. So, so staying with you, Senator, so yesterday I, I was uh, at Council of Foreign Relations, uh, and I, I thought it was uh, significant that the first session they had of all this week was around COP28. Uh, and everything around climate and the impact of, in that manner. And as you just mentioned, too often these conversations are two fifty thousand foot. It's not practical. Uh, would love to have you share best case and best practices of policies that could be replicated in other places, uh, especially in the environment that we're in. You know, unfortunately, not much is going to happen in D.C. in transformational change in the next year plus. This is going to be what happens in city and states, uh, and so pros and cons, challenges, opportunities on how people can take that, that back home on how to make legislation the way you all did? Well, in many ways, uh, the Pacific Coast of British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California have a deep sense of alignment. We had the luxury of Washington State of going second in terms of building a carbon pricing program. And what we learned from California's cap and trade program with a deep sense of intentionality and humility to learn this lesson was what works and what doesn't. We now have uh, carbon pricing, our, we call it cap and invest, our cap and invest carbon pricing program. $63 is the price of our allowances. We're approaching European level carbon pricing, covers 75% of our economy. And that is based upon the lessons learned from California. The second element that we did right in that is the environmental justice and equity issue. We had very strong support from our 29 federally recognized tribes, and we had strong, unanticipatedly strong support from many communities of color and disproportionately impacted uh, communities. The third element is we tied it in, as you mentioned, with transportation. We got rid of the old cliches and stereotypes that energy and transportation are separate. And we looked deeply at what it took to link those together. Uh, and then finally, we looked at the low carbon fuel standard, which is a deep decarbonization within the transportation sector. So that was a grand bargain politically that passed 25-24 in our state Senate. So it just goes to show that political compromise is possible when it's based upon best practices, lessons learned, and listening deeply to the community. And, and, and tying it to the numbers, right? You were very clear that there is a, a, a economic necessity and there's a livelihood necessity around this. You know, you know when uh, I was still in the assembly when, when COVID was happening, and I, and I said, you can't talk about addressing what's happening with COVID without recognizing the environmental injustice and environmental racism, quite frankly, that's happening in a lot of these communities. You're telling people to social distance, but if you have seven people in a home, hard to do that um, in those dynamics and in, in that manner. Um, Will, coming to you next, uh, you know, you know, President Biden earlier today, you know, had this slightly important speech at UNGA, you know, all the traffic that's happening right now across the city, uh, and, and of course talked about many of the different challenges that are happening, one of which, of course, uh, heat waves, the impact on that, the impact on systems, uh, and recognizing, obviously, the connection around energy and climate itself. Uh, it'd be helpful if you can shed light on the objectives within IRA. Do they clash? with National Grid Ventures, existing priorities, they're the align. Where are those gaps and where are those opportunities? Again, we want to be very practical in this room. And to the panelists, I'll also say, if anything happens or said, feel free to jump in um, as well. You know, it's not like family feud. I don't want you to get that aggressive out here, but feel free to jump in if you hear something there. Um, Will, go ahead. Yeah, we absolutely see the IRA as um, a huge piece of legislation and, and step forward. Uh, we think it's, it's fantastic gives a, a ton of opportunity. Um, and what it really does is, is some industrial policy. So that's different than the tax credits in the energy sector we've seen before, which have been much more targeted. Uh, this is really more about, again, developing the industrial infrastructure for clean energy. And that's huge. And I don't think, uh, I haven't heard quite enough talked about in that regard, but um, for us, it, it absolutely aligns, and the incentives, the subsidies are there for the things I talked about, um, onshore renewables, offshore wind, and then a critical component, uh, which is clean fuel. So hydrogen, uh, there's also support for renewable natural gas. Uh, those sorts of things are going to be absolutely necessary to make a full transition 
So it's not just about the renewable generation technologies, but all the different pieces we need to put together. There are a couple of gaps uh, that we, we hope can be filled, and I think the administration is aware of this and, and thinking about uh, what they can do within the existing legislation to fill some of these gaps. And that's in some of the, the projects that can be delivered in the short term. Uh, they can't necessarily participate in the full development of the industrial policy because of the time frames. It'll take years, if not a decade or more, to develop some of the domestic content and supply chain uh, that's incentivized by the IRA. Those projects need support, and it's critical that they move forward, that investment, billions of dollars of investment, to keep the industries moving forward. And then the other is electric transmission. I mentioned the, the, uh, the grid, access to the grid. It's fundamental. You know, we can produce a lot of clean electricity, clean energy, but we have to be able to get it onto the system and from where it's produced to where it's consumed. So a lot more needs to be done uh, in that space as well. I, I want to come back later on how do we make sure as this all happening, we, we're creating economic opportunities for communities of color, and I want everyone to be able to touch on that uh, very practically. You know, Councilwoman, you, you, you mentioned uh, in, in L.A., it's impossible to ignore the, you know, the homelessness challenge and crisis has been real. Uh, and, and there's been a very intentional approach by, by the mayor uh, and, and what she's been able to do immediately in addressing that. Uh, we'd love to get an understanding of how are you addressing infrastructure with sustainability? Because uh, we're facing that here. Like, you, 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 again, you can't have one without the other, and you're the, the perfect city to be able to talk about how that practically happens on the ground. If there's a best practice, again, that could be shared, please do. So the city of L.A. actually doesn't have a capital infrastructure plan. Uh, there's no one document or one series of documents, um, which is kind of wild because you, you can't get where you need to go unless you know where you're going. And I think part of that stems from a lack of, of funding. And you're not going to spend the money on planning for something if you don't know where the money's going to come from in the long term. Um, but that's starting to change. And I think the IRA money, um, uh, the IIJA money, uh, and then just a general sense that we have to be moving faster and more intentionally is all sort of coalescing around us doing that planning work. Um, we ha that's not to say we haven't been doing a lot of the work we have has just been really siloed. So in the last decade, the city of Los Angeles, the county of LA, has um, taxed itself in a multiplicity of different ways for transportation, uh, around water and stormwater treatment uh, and reuse, uh, around parks and open space. So it's about a billion dollars of new revenue, local revenue a year that we're bringing in. But it's all siloed. And, and as we all know, the work really should be intersectional. And, and every time we try and, and do that work, without bringing a new funding stream to that work, it's been really hard to get people to keep coming back to the table. So, um, but it's starting to happen, and, and part of why I ran was because I saw this, this lack of coherence and, and intersectional planning. Um, but, you know, there's some specific ways that IRA, I think, can be really helpful. It, it's not as much money, of course, as we, we all know we need, uh, but it can be used as seed money. And, and that seed money uh, will help soften the blow of, of mandates that we know we need to be implementing. So for example, uh, the city council in LA is, is uh, discussing the idea of, of requiring cooling apparatus in people's houses because a lot of people don't have any sort of cooling. Uh, the further inland you go, the hotter it is. Uh, it's an environmental justice issue. It's a public health issue. Um, and you know, it would be easy for us to just go to wall AC units and give people a voucher through our, our uh, DWP to go get one from Home Depot, but that's not where we need to go. And that was the initial conversation was, let's do that. It's like, no, no, let's talk about heat pumps and energy efficiency and um, knowing that it costs more, but uh, we can use that to incent early adopters as we impose new requirements. And so I think the IRA money could be really helpful uh, in, 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 like I said, softening the blow. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, L.A. City is one of 88 cities in L.A. County. It's the largest, but it's one of, one of 88. My, count, my little council district touches three other cities. Uh, and so you can't do regional planning without having regional governance. And, and there are examples of where we do that really well. So Metro is a regional transit authority. Um, we, we passed this thing um, called Measure W a couple of years ago that brings coherent governance around water and, and broader reuse, which because when it rains, you know, water doesn't care where it's, it's landing, it's going to flow where it's going to flow. 
uh, but we didn't have a regional entity to do that work. And so as we think about how we can better capitalize on these federal dollars and try and bring more money to Los Angeles, um, thinking about the governance is, is really important. And um, it's a little chicken and eggy, though, because we're not going to create that governance if we don't have ongoing funding and IRA's one-time money. And like you said, it's, it's hard to access that money. And so, so what we really, at the end of the day, need to figure out is, is an ongoing funding stream for climate work uh, and to create sort of a regional governance structure to allow us to deploy those dollars. And, and that's what we're focused on right now. I, I want to stay there. Maria, I'm coming back in a second. I want to stay there. And uh, I'm going to ask Senator also to jump in here as, 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 from the elected perspective and the dynamic. So one, I'm just trying to process still that there wasn't a regional governance or an entity doing any of this intersectional work in a city like LA. I mean, that's just kind of hard to even process right there. So I'm just internalizing that uh, itself. So uh, yeah, it's just like, okay, yeah, condolences, as you said earlier, congratulations, condolences. Uh, what was equally a challenge in getting community residents to buy in, right? Because I think in a lot of times, for those that have had the opportunity of being elected officials, we see the data, we see the information, like, okay, you know what? Yeah, this makes sense. So it makes sense to do this. But then you're trying to get someone to make a, a life shift, right? You're trying to get someone to say, you know what, I'm going to spend a little bit more now because you're telling me it's going to be better down the line. Was that a part of any of the conversations happening in L.A. and or in Washington of getting community buy-in uh, to make this better? Yeah, I I think the biggest challenge right now is, is that it's very hard to get people to focus on it, um, to get people engaged. It, when the county of Los Angeles was adopting its, uh, its first ever sustainability plan for the region, the region of Los Angeles did not have a sustainability plan, let alone an office focused on it. Um, the biggest challenge is, is getting people to show up, you know, childcare, um, doing it at a time when people can come. Um, you know, every week I get hundreds of notices of evictions for my district alone. And so getting people to show up and focus 20 years down the line on what do we want our community to look like, let alone asking them to pay a little more, is just completely untenable. And so if we're going to ask, if we're going to put in, you know, make our buildings more energy efficient, we need to figure out how to work with landlords and um, keep those costs to a minimum um, or figure out how to cover the delta of those costs and... Um, because no one's thinking about the long term right now. We're just we're focused on 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 whatever crisis of the day is, is unfolding. You know, we we find ourselves consumed by the question of cost. But truthfully, what we're doing in this radical transformation of the economy away from a fossil fuel based system is we're capturing the negative externalities of fossil fuel and we're embedding that in the price of the product. And so ultimately it's really a shift. And this idea that it's all about cost really pulls us away from real people. So for example, one of the primary, one of the first uses of proceeds of our new cap and invest program is free public transportation for all young people 18 and younger in Washington state. All buses, all ferries, all trains are free in Washington state for young people, period. So we tried to begin to provide services and value to real people that's disconnected from just this attachment that everything is about cost. We're going to be the first uh, planet in world, uh, you know, in global, of course, or societal or in the entire universe, right, of history that, uh, that uh, makes ourselves extinct because it, wa it wasn't cost competitive to save ourselves. It's just insane. So we have to look at who needs to bear the burden, and we need to look at investments that really impact people. So multifamily housing should have free charging infrastructure absolutely everywhere. That's a use of proceeds of the investment from a, a cap and invest type of program. We need decarbonization of uh, the, the maritime sector. We need decarbonization of the transportation sector relative to the ports. All are in low, low income, near low-income communities, and you've got this disproportionality issue uh, around highways and zoning that we know so well. So we have to decarbonize those areas that where real people get value and feel a sense of connection. So I think one of our biggest faults is lack of imagination, lack of courage, and lack of willingness to come up with solutions that give people value 
value that they can touch and feel and not be an existential white paper from the academic institution to you know, 50,000 feet above the r real world. And that's where philanthropy is going. They're, they're showing up and leaning in to giving communities a sense of ownership and engagement as opposed to uh, requiring inputs and, uh, and, and process. They're talking about outputs and results. Can I respond to that really fast? Yeah, I mean, especially since you talked yes. about galaxies and planets and everything like that. Go ahead. You know, as, as a newly elected, confronting the bureaucracy of a big city like L.A., what's been perhaps most frustrating is, is that mindset is entrenched in our departments, right? And so figuring out how to cause them to reframe how they see their own budgets and what they value and, and think, like you said, and sort of thinking about this... Um, I started off by talking about a scarcity mindset at the city of LA and flipping that and figuring out we do have all these billions of dollars a year. How do we, how do we most efficiently deploy those, effectively deploy those uh, to get people doing what we know they need to be doing? So it's hard. No question. And I'm going to come to Maria here, but I, I think the, well, a few different pieces that were mentioned uh, and also given some best practices, talking about the shift of how to support a family so they can show up in meetings. Eagle Academy, which is here in New York, it, it, it's an education related, obviously not climate related, but the, the change they made to have more people show up at their, their parent meetings that were on Wednesday nights is that they made them Saturday morning breakfast. Just, just doing that. Because the parents were just like, I can't get here on time. Uh, and you know, let's be realistic. You move it to a time and give people some food, all of a sudden, you know, uh, and, and Eagle Academy has the highest graduation rate of any school in New York for black and brown kids. Right? So th those subtleties. And to uh, the Senator's point about uh, making it very practical. I loved hearing about the free transportation, right? Because now someone is like, oh, okay, this money is actually helping us in a very real way, right? And, and I would also encourage people when you go back home, anything you can do that's benefiting young people is going to bring more people in. <laughs> you know, if someone sees you're helping their kid, things change. Things change. Uh, Maria, philanthropy is, is essential in this especially to what the councilwoman was just mentioning, where there's that constant dynamic of funding and people wondering like, okay, well, is this gonna be seeding an effort or continuing an effort? Uh, and a lot of times you're being contacted in, in, in philanthropy regularly, uh, and not just philanthropy, but also just the investment arms within philanthropy, which I think is essential, of help me map out that multi-year program in that manner. How do you envision Rockefeller's role in, in ensuring that these funds are not just uh, short-term benefits, but really lay the longer foundation? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, um, I do think philanthropy needs to be there. And we have, first, as the Rockefeller Foundation, we made a big decision. It dates back to about a year ago, and we just announced it that week. Is Actually, climate now drives everything that we do. Food, health, economic equity, it, climate is the center of everything we do. So that was big for us. We announced we're, we're going to put uh, our funding, about a billion dollars over the next five years, all focused on climate through these different initiatives. The second thing we did that, because you hear all about the execution, the need for capacity. Um, we decided this is where we need to partner with peer philanthropies and not necessarily each philanthropy doing its own initiative. We just joined something called the Invest in Our Future, which is a pooled effort focused on the whole execution around the IRA and specifically this Justice 40 piece. So the IRA's got about 369 billion, right, that's targeted to a whole host of programs. And we've gone through, we identify about 100 billion of that is specifically targeted to underserved communities. So how do we get those on the map? The Invest in Our Future initiative, we've got really three prongs. And by the way, we're not, the, the solutions really sit with Katie. They sit with the states. We're, we know, and I think that's a really important piece for philanthropy, that the solutions don't sit with us. They sit in the communities. You go to any city, you have state discussions, there's a lot of ideas out there. We're, we're trying to lean in, invest in our futures, one, the capacity building, and how do we, we need to engage with the community to see, well, where do our dollars help with that capacity building? 
Um, second area is just the, the big hurdles. I think um, the prior panel talked about the permitting issues. That's a big one. Um, and third is the dialogue, and, and we are quite passionate about this from the foundation's perspective, is the quality jobs angle. Because these communities need to see benefit. Um, within this initiative, which is about um, $200 uh, million right now, uh, about across uh, 10 plus philanthropies, is um, it's showcasing how there is success from this IRA. I mean, we, we talked about, I think there's like 119 different programs, 35 plus agencies, just figuring out like where you go to get the dollars is hard. But the first mover is always the hardest, right? So we, we are trying with this effort also to bring up and communicate about the benefits. Because when communities see that there's a certain, uh, that like the recharging stations at um, multifamily, a lot of community-based actually, getting renewable energy into community-based models. But you need to highlight those successes and the learnings. In fact, the first step may not be perfect, but really getting that out there and making the learning curve go much faster, I think that is something we're highly focused on. And we've come together as peer philanthropies so that we don't add yet another layer to the process. Well, it's also just good business acumen you're demonstrating, right? Because when you say, you're talking about pooling of resources, that's no different than a, a syndicate for an investment deal, right? Like it's understanding uh, if you have more there, then you can leverage it even greater. And equally appreciating your point of the necessity of realizing different roles, right? Not every single person is supposed to be drafting the legislation, right? Like there, there's different. There, some are supposed to be the communicators, and a lot are going to be implementers. But also the 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 intentionality of capacity building, as you just mentioned, Senator, your agenda. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that that really touches on. There's a dark underside to the IRA in terms of a challenge. So we're talking about real people living real lives, getting understandable, practical benefit from really historic climate work. The challenge is that. In hundreds of side meetings in New York this week, there's finance conversations about pension funds and there's risk mitigation policies and all kinds of venture capital and private equity and all kinds of uh, deep conversation. Much of the benefit is in tax credits that go to large corporations relative to the value of investing in decarbonization. So in my state, we have 109 large emitters, factories, manufacturing, major facilities that are covered by our, our cap and invest program. They have to pay to decarbonize, so they have to buy allowances. But their cost of investing in rooftop solar in decarbonization of other renewables in their supply chain, decarbonizing that is now one third cheaper because it's all tax deductible, right? So real people don't see that. So some of the money is the billions of dollars that the agency folks at the federal level get up here and talk about a pot of money A, B, and C, and some of it is the dark underside that real people don't see that is really a tax policy that impacts this. And so what we have to have is a sense of radical transparency and a, and a deeper understanding. And that's where the California bill steps up into this a little bit. But to understand how the money flows has never been more important than this time. No question. And a, and a lot of times we, we, we saw this throughout the stimulus bills, et cetera. People see the tax credits, they hear the tax credits, and you're like, well, nothing's actually benefiting me. But like, actually, if you see what's happening in your life, it's benefiting you but we're not doing a very good job of communicating that uh, and making it very practical here. Uh, I'm gonna ask one closing here, and then if, if people have questions in the audience, it's your time to be thinking about that uh, in, in that manner uh, itself. One very specific action step that needs to be taken that would help support you in your work that's relevant uh, relative to IRA, and separately, in addition, what is one way you can support those in this room because I do think there has to be that collaborative relationship that happens here. So one concrete, actionable step that would be helpful so that you can continue to do the work in, in IRA implementation and in one way you could support those in this room. Uh, I'll go from my right on down. Senator, I'll start with you and then come on down and then we'll open it up for Q&A. 
So I think one specific thing that we have to have is that we have to have radical transparency to really understand not just carbon footprints, but the, 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 the true impact of a lot of these policies. Uh, we're taking some steps in that way, but it's just completely inadequate to understand how the money flows. Uh, I think there's enormous opportunity. We need so much renewable energy that all of the siting issues that we talked about all happen at the state and local level. We have to have a deeper understanding of true local impacts for societal benefits. And that's offshore wind, that's community solar projects in, uh, in, in areas where you have transmission lines. So the local impacts have to be dealt with in a much more compelling way as opposed to just saying you need to suck it up and take this because we need so much renewable energy, it's unimaginable. And before going to a way that you can help the room, Senator? You know, I, I think we live in a time where it's categorically the opposite of not invented here. It's just a, an embrace of global best practices, of lessons learned. And we, we can share those insights. California and Washington and Oregon, we partner on a lot of things. We want other states to do the same thing in terms of companies and the startup culture, the ecosystem. Startups need anchor tenant customers. They need not just funding, but they need utilities and others to lean into the work of really allowing them to test out their innovation. And we need things like direct air capture to contribute that. And we need to, to lean into that. And I think people need to recognize how imperative it is to us to think about this as a 27-year sprint. I'm just going to build, actually, on that. The point about the amount of infrastructure that re is required is extremely important. And what that really means is we cannot do it without communities. Communities are people. These are policy-driven objectives. People have to be on board, which means Communities have to be first. Our offshore wind uh, joint venture, we actually named Community Offshore Wind to emphasize that point. And we focus on how do we make bringing this infrastructure in, it's a lot of infrastructure, how do we make that not just positive from the perspective of bringing clean energy and the contribution to the energy transition, but to the real impact that, that we can have on communities. And I would also say environmental justice is absolutely critical in this regard as well. We have the opportunity not just to treat environmental justice communities equally, but equitably and undo some of the harms that have been done over past generations. And I think you know, we have to take that opportunity, put communities right there at the front end of this. And what can we do to, to help with that? is set an example, and that's what we're trying to do with these large infrastructure projects that we develop. To the point, this Dr. Jalone White Newsom, if you have not heard of her name, Council of Environmental Quality, uh, one of the leads in making sure that equity is implemented across the administration, across uh, the nation, to the point I was mentioned by Will around Justice 40 and others. So Dr. Jalone White Newsom, look for her name, an incredible sister, Councilwoman. So getting back to your first question, which is how I'm going to answer the last one, you know, capacity building for us is, is a real challenge. And so I think if the federal government would be willing to focus in on, on our 10 largest metropolises in the country, where you get your biggest bang for your buck, and actually provide liaisons to help our cities navigate this vast program with hundreds of different funding opportunities, uh, and, and really focus in LA, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, and on and on, Houston, we could be so much more effective in, in grabbing those dollars and more effectively using those dollars. Um, and then your second question was about how do we partner together? How do we help each other? And I, look, I think LA is, is in a place right now where we have so much catching up to do. And I'm there really to figure out with people who are more expert than I am in all these spaces, what could we be doing? I'm, we want to try things. You know, I, pilots have their advantages and disadvantages. But LA is open for business, and we're looking for partners who want to try radical new things. And I, everything from financing to new technologies, uh, there's so much opportunity in LA right now, and there's so much need. And you have a, a leadership there between the mayor and, and a, a almost majority new council, where there's a receptivity that may not have always been there. And so um, come talk to me. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> 
philanthropy needs to listen and get the input at the community level and on equity issues. And I think we hear it through our community-based organizations, the city governments, I fully agree with this. The, the cities, the big cities, are also often the route to help the states. So this city level, state level, um, listening to where the actual capacity building needs are and figuring out how does philanthropy directly address that. Philanthropy is only so big, but you do need to get to these critical bottlenecks. How, like, how's the most effective way to do that? And I think we have a lot. Um, uh, we sh we shouldn't be leaning on that. We should be leaning in. Uh, I think where philanthropy is useful is yes, we have our dollars. We support our grantees. We support initiatives doing that. Um, we are a convener. And I will say, you know, like the, um, we can often um, bridge public private sector, and that can be through convenings. Um, we try to bring that that um, power to bear um, on some of these these discussions. But um, there is a lot of talk about, you know, we we do convene. I mean, this week there's so many different convenings on so many topics. It's like getting all of this to the convenings leading to maybe the implementation convenings is, uh, is I think, something we, we all need to take to heart. You want to be the convener of the conveners. I got you right there, right there. <laughs> so convening, capacity building, financing, sharing of best practices uh, itself uh, here. Uh oh, my man, Ali. All right, now, now I know we in business. What's up, brother? Uh, can't let White House folks in the room. We get excited when we see each other right there. Um, uh, we're at time. Uh, itself, and we want to be mindful of the hour uh, if, we, if we can. So just to, to tie this all together, this is a historic opportunity, a transformational opportunity, and it's not just about people making money, which is that's one thing that can happen, but it's about making impact uh, and transforming what's going on in our communities and making sure that equity is implemented in that manner. And if our team can be helpful with that at Atlas Strategy Group, please let us know. Uh, let's give a round of applause for this incredible panel, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much this wonderful panel. Thank you, Michael, for a fabulous facilitation, as always. Um, so everybody, we are about to just take a very quick two-minute break to grab some water, grab some coffee, and we will be right back with some very special speakers. Thank you very much.
handled it uh, beautifully. It's always good to have people agree and disagree, and it's always important <laughs> to allow people to speak. Um, so kudos to our hosts for managing uh, the entertainment so well. All right, let us get started. As you know, we have 10 minutes. Uh, so we will be on rapid fire here. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time introducing Ali Zaidi. Uh, I'm not going to introduce myself, Mindy Luber, but I was in the book as well. Uh, one of the greatest opportunities we have put forward by this administration is the Inflation Reduction Act. We've heard a lot about it. We've all talked about it. We've probably been to 10 sessions on it. Uh, it is a big deal. It does have the ability to be absolutely transformative as it relates to our energy systems, our transportation systems. The time to act is now and to make sure it's all real. I'm going to ask Ali, tell us about it. What is happening on the ground? There are some stories you could tell us, and what's going on in the private sector as well? Well, first of all, great to be here and, and to be with you. Um, what's remarkable one year in is the transformation we are already seeing on the ground, and I think in business models and the way people are approaching climate in every single sector of the economy. And I think that's a critical part of this. Um, you look at the agriculture sector where um, Secretary Vilsack has stood up a climate smart, smart, <laughs> climate smart, I'm hanging out. Like yeah, <laughs> a climate smart commodities uh, partnership program. That now 60,000 farms, 25 million acres enlisted into climate smart agriculture practices. Um, one of the things that we're particularly excited about is regardless of what sector we're focused on, the Inflation Reduction Act, really because the DNA of the programs um, are coded to prioritize manufacturing in the United States, have spurred a manufacturing renaissance all across the country. And what's exciting from a justice and economic development and equity perspective is that transformation is taking place in uh, communities where economic opportunity had left years ago. Uh, whether that's Weirton, uh, West Virginia, where a steel plant had shuttered, it's now producing batteries uh, that are uh, helping stabilize the grid. Um, whether it's Dalton, Georgia, uh, where they used to be the sofa capital of the world, um, those jobs shipped away, they are now the solar capital of the world. Um, or, um, or places like San Juan, uh, New Mexico, San Juan Generating Station, gone away now because of aspects of the tax code, an incredibly exciting place to build out solar energy and to rehire those electrical workers that had been laid off uh, and otherwise would have been left behind. I suspect in this room there are a lot of businesses, investors, of course, NGOs, and others. When I travel around the country talking about the IRA, supporting your work, um, there are times when companies don't know how to take advantage of it, how to get involved. Um, give everybody in this room um, some ideas about how to take advantage of this extraordinary opportunity. You know, this is not, um, this is actually a big part of the opportunity here. Uh, the fact that people don't know and that there will be innovation on how to make this easier. So the biggest driver of both emissions reductions and uh, getting support out through the IRA bill is the tax code. Um, and the tax code is really quite broad in its sweep. Uh, it includes support for um, generation, clean electricity from a broad set of sources, really technology neutral, uh, including support for battery storage and firming up the grid. It's got support for um, uh, electric vehicles and um, uh, other mobile uh, decarbonization plays. And then there's this really powerful uh, tax credit, which I think has way overshot expectations in a good way, and that is the Section 45X tax credit, which is um, providing 
a production tax credit for making the inputs into the clean energy economy here in the United States. So thing number one is um, reorienting your productivity uh, or generation in a way that allows you to take advantage of, in certain cases, 30, in certain cases, uh, 50 or above percent, uh, either production tax credit or investment tax credit. That's a really, really big deal. This comes to the challenge and opportunity part. Not everyone is um, familiar with how to structure their business in a way to monetize tax credits. We've had a, a tax equity market in the past that has both very traditional players providing the tax equity and then a lot of traditional players leveraging the tax equity. Um, so one of the things I think we need more of is turnkey business models where um, folks are developing uh, financing vehicles that uh, people can plug into and take advantage of the stream of benefits without having to do all the structuring, the hard work of structuring themselves. And in some cases, as the federal government, we are trying to structure that vehicle, which stacks and sort of staples all of these incentives together. Um, in the case of distributed generation, that is the EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is going to, which is this massive $27 billion play to seed green banks around the country, help them scale up and then lend in this space in a way that's structured finance. In the rural uh, arena, we're making the biggest investment in rural electrification since the New Deal. There, the Department of Agriculture is helping stack these incentives together. And in the power sector and uh, other uh, places, we've got really powerful new programs through the Department of Energy. Uh, the one, and we really know how to name these, uh, the 1706 program, just rolls right off the tongue, um, is really designed for that power sector transformation that we're seeing. Uh, how do you facilitate things like reconductoring existing power lines? How do you help existing power infrastructure that's transitioning pick up all of the advantages of this moment and create jobs and opportunity in the literal same place people live. That's great. Now, Ali is talking about a lot of complicated stuff that <clears throat> probably most of us in the room understand, but maybe, uh, maybe not our neighbors. Um, when Mrs. Jones comes to me or says, I'm going to go buy a heat pump or I'm going to go do something, how do I take advantage of that IRA thing? Um, how do we translate this into the people shopping at Best Buy or uh, living down the block from you? Yeah, we meet them where they are. Yeah. So Jennifer Granholm and I, Secretary of Energy, went to the Home Depot in Atlanta, Georgia, and we talked to both the leadership of Home Depot and the folks who work there, and they're helping people understand the Biden tax credits that they qualify for when they're buying a new uh, window that's more efficient or a new appliance that's more energy efficient. So that's going to be thing number one, is meeting people at the point of sale uh, and making that as seamless of an experience as possible. And companies have a role to play there, right? Some companies are fronting the capital. Uh, in the case of the vehicle tax credits, we actually have a feature in the tax code that will allow us to help dealers front um, the, the monetary value of the tax credit. So that's going to be a big deal. The second is by setting conspicuous, big, bold goals that themselves <clears throat> drive momentum and awareness in the marketplace. I went to Maine, where the governor had set a goal to deploy 175,000 heat pumps. By 2027, they got it done. Uh, uh, a few years early, so she's raised her sights, and they're going to do even more. And by the way, they're using that to massively expand the workforce in this space. So setting that goal, whether it's municipality or a state, I think is incredibly important. And then we've got to have tools on the internet that help people shop and understand. Uh, on our end, we've created a website, cleanenergy.gov where you've got sort of a doll's house, so you click on the various appliances and a pop-up tell you exactly what incentives you qualify for. Great, well let's all make sure we go to that website. Uh, this is a really uh, quick fireside chat. I'm gonna take one or two questions, then I'm gonna ask Ali a final question and then we'll let you go. Any quick questions here?
Hi, curious how the administration is weighing um, the vast amount of new oil and gas infrastructure that it has been approving against all these great benefits in the IRA. Um, does the IRA make up for the known destruction that all these new uh, pipelines, LNG, depots, and uh, drilling stations will cause? So the focus here is to go as uh, quickly and aggressively as we can to seize the massive uh, opportunity for the American people and our industrial base that shifting to clean energy represents. Um, and that's what we're doing. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in 2030 alone will represent a gigaton of emissions reductions. And what it represents is uh, tripling of the pace with which we deploy technologies and then hopefully manufacture them here in the United States. In terms of fossil fuels, um, I think the president's been very clear about our need to shift to a clean energy future. His recognition that true energy security comes from not being reliant on um, these technologies and uh, the way we do that is by expanding consumer choice, availability, and access to these technologies. So telling folks they should go buy something that they can't afford is not the answer. Helping make that accessible and affordable, as the president has worked to do, is, and that's where we're fully invested. Um, but we're, we have proposed a number of times uh, in each budget that the president has put forward to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. He's conserved more lands and acres, over 20 million, uh, as a president uh, than anyone else at this point uh, in his presidency. So there's significant uh, effort underway to make sure we're leveraging nature-based solutions, that we're finding solutions both on the demand and supply side to move us forward uh, quickly and aggressively. So I'm going to take, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to take the prerogative, thank you. The economy is on everybody's mind. What are we seeing on jobs coming straight from the IRA? How's that having an impact? What do you expect to see coming, going forward? Sorry. You know, the it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. Sure. And uh, if you look at what's happened over the last year, inflation has come down in the United States uh, at a pace and speed that puts us ahead of the pack relative to the rest of the world. Inflation down two thirds. Uh, that's not the case uh, for the rest of the G8. Um, G7 nations. So that's thing number one, is how do we bring costs down, continue to work aggressively to do that. One of the big drivers of inflation over the last uh, couple of years um, has been energy uh, destabilization uh, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and the second has been supply chain challenges um, post and through pandemic. We're getting after both of those things by expanding uh, the diversity of clean energy supply here in the United States, the president presiding over an unprecedented expansion of that, and then making sure those supply chains come home. Um, you know, you've seen uh, consistent and historic job creation. We're seeing job satisfaction numbers rise. We're seeing wages rise. Employers are competing for talent. Um, that's a race to the top we like here in the United States. We're going to continue to invest in our communities, continue to invest in those workers, and continue to invest in transitioning to a clean economy as rapidly and aggressively as we can. Great. Um, let's thank Ali Zaidi, who has been around the country supporting, building, and making sure we all get the benefit of the IRA. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mindy. Everyone, um, it is my um, great honor and privilege uh, to uh, join you in closing out um, the Hub Live today. Excuse me, sorry, I'd make sure you guys can hear me. So it's my great honor and privilege to close out um, Climate Week's Hub Live with the most esteemed speaker, 
uh, John Podesta. Um, and I know he needs a very little introduction. Um, and you would probably be much happier in just jumping into the conversation. Um, but I will say just a huge thanks to you uh, for joining us here today. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us here. So um, with that, I would love um, to just sort of set the stage. Uh, we spent uh, the last couple of hours as part of Energizing for America really thinking about um, uh, you know, the barriers, the ways that we can accelerate um, the problem of all of these investments being um, sort of, you know, just this huge infusion, but also that opportunity. And I know this is something you are thinking about literally every minute. Um, your name has come up in several sessions as um, a person who is really thinking about this. Um, given your extremely extensive experience in policy making and clean energy, what do you find the most promising or challenging right now for IRA implementation? Both promising and challenging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, let me, uh, thanks, Angela. It's great to be here with all of you. And uh, I caught the tail end of, uh, of my good friend and colleague Ali Zaidi's uh, presentation up here. And it reminded me of the old adage that probably everything's been said, but not everybody said it. <laughs> so um, let, me, let, me give it, let me tell you from my personal perspective how I see this. I mean, the IRA is obviously maybe not so obviously, but the IRA is the largest uh, investment in clean energy and climate change in the history, not just of the United States, but of the world. Uh, but it's coming at a time uh, when we're challenged more than, uh, than I think people expected to be with uh, the effects of extreme weather uh, really uh, reaching across the world. Um, and I uh, sort of fall back uh, to, to your question about opportunity and challenge uh, and uh, always reference back to the uh, 2018 IPCC 1.5 report uh, when the world's uh, scientists, by consensus, uh, measured the difference between what a 1.5 world looks like and what a two-degree world uh, looks like uh, and reoriented people towards this idea that we had to uh, meet a, uh, come to the point where we were net zero by mid-century uh, in order to stabilize the atmosphere. And in that report, they said something I think uh, that I keep up on my wall, uh, which is that what that will take is a, a transformation of the global economy on the size and scale that's never occurred in human history. So that's exciting. <laughs> and, it's, and it's also daunting to think about doing that in 27 years uh, transform the global economy, not the U.S. economy, but the global economy on the size and scale that's never occurred before. That's the challenge before us. I feel like the IRA gives us the tools to get us a good chunk of the way there. I, I, I'm, I'm confident that with the investments we're seeing, uh, with the uh, money that's being deployed, uh, uh, against innovation, against environmental justice, to try to lift communities up. Uh, we can meet the, uh, the goal that the president uh, set uh, in the spring of 2021 around Earth Day that we can reduce our emissions by 50 to 52 percent by 2030. But that's just the start. <laughs> so we need to use this decade, and I think the uh, resources in the IRA, particularly in some of the newer technologies, uh, to kick that cycle of innovation into really high gear if we're going to have a chance of hitting that target uh, by 2050 of going net zero, where we're taking as much carbon out of the atmosphere as we're putting into it, and eventually bend the temperature curve down. It's interesting, uh, just to pick, on a po uh, pick up a point that you're making, um, we were in a, a roundtable earlier about built environment, and there was a concern that there's also an uptake of innovation issue, right? So the innovation can sit out there for years and years and years before it's able to like go into the system. Um, obviously, I think that's again a pro both promising and a challenge, right? Um, it's one of these paradigms that we really have to overcome. I mean, it's been a year since the IRA passed. What do you, where do you see some of these barriers these, or also these places of accomplishment that have really sort of stuck out to you at least in the first year? Well, look, I, th I think uh, we've been on, on a uh, rapid schedule to get guidance out for 
where really the bulk of the money is in this bill, which is uh, in the support of the private sector through, through um, and I want to say a word about direct pay at the end of this, but support of the private sector uh, it, through the tax code. So people, uh, for the first time, businesses, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, have 10 years of certainty that, uh, that the investments that they're making uh, will have the support that comes through the tax benefits that are, that are in the code. Um, there's, and we've tried to ensure that people have confidence in that and, they, and there, there's clarity in that. And we've seen the market react to that. $115 billion in clean energy uh, technology alone in, uh, just since the IRA passed. Another $120 billion in announcements of deployment of utility scale uh, renewable p uh, power. So these are huge numbers, big projects happening all over the country. Uh, and uh, uh, the Rhodium just last week did a new analysis that said 4% of total spending on structures, equipment, uh, are in the clean energy space, which is doubled from what it was four years ago. So you see this rapid momentum towards uh, picking up this challenge, utilizing the advantages of the IRA, building real businesses, uh, whether that's uh, battery factories, uh, uh, the full solar supply chain, uh, the, uh, you know, the ability, uh, as uh, Credit Suisse uh, estimated, that 90% of solar panels will be made in the U.S. Uh, by the ter turn of the decade. Uh, so that's, you know, that's huge progress, I think, and I think uh, that's what we need. The bill, I mentioned direct pay. The bill has another feature which is really different and really unique and I'm really excited about, which is that for the first time, uh, there, uh, there is a feature in the bill that lets non-federal taxpayers take advantage of this support for clean energy, clean technology, clean vehicles, clean buildings, et cetera. So if you're a nonprofit, if you're a community-based group, if you're a big nonprofit hospital, if you're a city or a state, uh, even though you don't pay federal taxes, federal income taxes, those uh, production tax credits, investment tax credits, can if you build a project, put it into serve it, the Treasury writes you a check. It's not a competitive program. If you meet the criteria, you get the money. And that could be 50, 60, 70 percent of a project cost, depending on where it's cited, whether you're using, paying uh, your workers prevailing wage, et cetera. That is a huge game changer. Uh, and I think change is sort of a power equation, really, to, to give uh, communities and, and cities and towns to be able to do this on their own, to uh, retrofit their fleets, to build out charging networks, uh, to build community solar, to build uh, power that uh, in, in their own communities. Uh, together with, with the uh, some of the other programs that we've already announced, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is a $27 billion essentially lending program uh, to put uh, solar on rooftops, to work with uh, uh, CDFIs, consumer unions, et cetera, to deploy uh, uh, clean technology in disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, and to do big projects across the country. These are big things, uh, and they're really good. Just today, uh, the Department of Energy announced uh, $400 million to support uh, states to improve their building codes. Over the course of the life of that program, that can save consumers $178 billion by their calculation uh, if states apply for the money and they uh, take on the challenge of making uh, the, that built space that you were talking about more efficient, healthier, uh, you know, better, better not just for the planet in the long run, but better for the residents in the short run. Uh, the USDA just announced uh, $1.5 billion uh, in, uh, uh, again, in every state uh, for community forestry to plant trees to reduce the differential between the heat load of poor neighborhoods and wealthy neighborhoods, which can be literally 10 degrees in the same uh, metropolitan area. 
uh, the Nature Conservancy, I think, averaged in the Northeast eight degrees difference between what uh, the heat load is on people living in poor neighborhoods with no tree cover versus people living in the suburbs. I can go on and on because there's, uh, we've already announced the opportunity for grants for uh, uh, 70 billion of the approximately 100 billion dollars that was in the bill. Uh, they're, in, they're in competition, so all that money has not been awarded yet. But um, we're embarked on uh, the biggest uh, uh, investment in rural electrification since the New Deal. It, USDA has $11 billion to spend on rural co-ops um, to transform the way they're producing and distributing energy. You know, there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of uh, speed bumps, uh, permitting, you know, other uh, supply chains. Uh, Ali was talking about the supply chain challenge in, in uh, offshore wind that we have right now. Uh, uh, there's the trying to uh, create more secure supply chains uh, and not be as dependent on, uh, on China for battery components, critical minerals, uh, upstream solar supply chains. So there's a lot of challenges, but there's just huge opportunity. And I think we're really excited that this money uh, is getting out the door, and, it, and we're doing it with the proper safeguards. Uh, you know, working with the inspectors general uh, to give us advice about the best way to make sure, rather than you're chasing the horse once it's out of the barn, <laughs> to make sure that it stays in the barn. So that there's, you know, these are uh, programs that uh, meet the president and the vice president's goals, and do it in a way with fiscal integrity. No, I love that, and I think. A lot of what you said really touches on community. So if I could take just one minute to sort of talk through some of the, or several minutes to think through, or talk us through how you structured what is going to be the largest invested, investment in disinvested communities historic, you know, ever made, and in addition to the sort of investment in clean energy and clean jobs and workforce training. I mean, there is just this IRA is so rich in that, and I think has become a model, an example for in, you know other countries, other municipalities who are thinking about how to direct money into those communities of most need. And so it would be great to kind of get a sense from you, like how that all came together. Yeah, I think um, you know it came together. I think r really because the president viewed this as you know we used the phrase before there was the IRA. There was a, the bill was called Build Back Better. <laughs> Well, what did that mean? It meant don't just build, reconstruct and build on, the, uh, on uh, an unequal allocation of capital that we've seen, the effects of racism over the years that we've seen on the way the economy is structured, but do it in a way that's thoughtful, that's reaching communities that have often borne the brunt of uh, a power plant and, and industrial pollution. They've had the cumulative effects of years of both uh, that pollution and disinvestment in their communities. Uh, and the mechanisms for doing that are many-fold in the bill, actually. But I think starting with the, those tax credits, you get um, – uh, the, there are base credits in the bill, but there are bonuses for investing in traditional energy communities, in disadvantaged communities, uh, making investments uh, against uh, – uh, publicly supported housing. Those are uh, uh, drivers enough that developers are looking to say, not just where's the green field, but where do I get that bonus? And that means that shifts the flow of capital back into communities that have really often been left out and left behind. That's one mechanism. There's specific um, uh, grants, largely housed at the EPA, that are aimed at uh, reducing the, the, uh, the impact of uh, pollution on communities and specifically dealing uh, with environmental justice uh, issues. In addition to those direct IRA programs, the president at the beginning of the administration uh, launched the Justice 40 initiative, where a broad range of federal programs are now uh, 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 noted. There's a there's a map of the communities, uh, and uh, agencies are directed 
to ensure that 40 percent of the benefits go to those communities that have often not received uh, benefits in the past. That's a game changer, I think. And that uh, CEQ, I think Brenda was here earlier yeah. today, uh, and OMB are uh, administering or running, you know, kind of sitting on top of making sure that uh, agencies are taking that seriously. But I have to tell you, I think agencies are actually enthusiastic about it. At least my colleagues in the, at, you know, in the uh, cabinet agencies that I work with are really enthusiastic about making sure that they make good uh, on that promise. Um, and then I mentioned the, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. That is really... Uh, more than two-thirds of that money is aimed at investment in uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities. That's $27 billion. That's a lot of capital uh, for in, uh, in a capital-starved uh, environment. So, you know, we're trying to use every mechanism we can to make sure that this is shaped with uh, not just investment in jobs in mind, which is front and center, but also with justice in mind. See, I love that because I think um, just giving people, especially within the federal government, a mandate like Justice 40, focus on this, do the work that needs to get to this goal, it just unlocks, I think, so much in terms of coordination, in terms of leadership. I, um, and so I think a lot of folks are, have been very interested to see sort of the internal workings of how that all came together so they can replicate. Um, I will ask a little bit of um, a critique that we've also heard the durability of the IRA. Um, and I think, you know, we- 10 years of durable tax credits. <laughs> exactly. You're I ask me how durable those real durable tax credits <laughs> really are. You know, I, I do think, you know, given this is also an international audience that joins us during Climate Week, um, you know, it is not uh, revealing anybody's history that, you know, the last few years have seen different takes on climate action for the United States. Um, and one question that often comes up is like, IRA is great, Justice 40 is awesome, um, all these tax credits are gonna be transformational. What's to stop anyone from actually just rolling them back? Well, I think um, uh, the power of the investments being made, the businesses being built, the jobs being created, the communities being transformed is, uh, will be extremely powerful. Now that's just taking hold. Um, but I think that, uh, and we've, we've seen, particularly the House Republicans target uh, the IRA uh, funding, uh, starting with HR1, their, their uh, permitting reform bill, which is the first bill uh, they considered, which cut back on particularly the environmental justice programs, uh, then taking it forward to the debt limit uh, uh, crisis, uh, where they finally backed down but tried to repeal the IRA. The uh, Ways and Means Committee has tried to repeal the tax credits. That hasn't made it to the floor yet. So I think it's like anybody who thinks that, that we don't need to defend this <laughs> uh, is mistaken. Um, or that it'll just all take care of itself is mistaken. But I think that um, we, we intend to defend it. Uh, the programs are actually popular. I, you know, I've worked on a broad range of policy issues, including uh, the Affordable Care Act that President Obama passed. And uh, the difference really between the, the defending these clean energy provisions and the Affordable Care Act was by the time the Affordable Care Act passed, it became, it had become very unpopular. Uh, that popularity built as people felt the effects of, of the Affordable Care Act. I think it continues to build with, in, in the IRA, there were also health uh, provisions uh, that uh, re will reduce the cost of prescription drugs, you know, cap the cost of insulin uh, for uh, people on Medicare. And uh, we've seen the market react so that uh, prices of insulin have come down really across the board. Um, uh, and there's a great deal of taxpayer uh, savings uh, from, from that health care cost. But I'm really just drawing the analogy to the ACA that as people begin to feel it, uh, as they see the benefits of it, um, you know, it's uh, as the president said in the State of the Union, likes to say on the campaign trail, <laughs> I'll see you at the ribbon cutting. Uh, to the Marjorie Taylor Re Greens and the Lauren Boberts who are seeing investment in their districts. Um, the, there's uh, uh, 
you know, one analysis is that the, the, it's only going to those districts. I don't think that's fair either. Really, these investments are happening across the country, across the board. And, uh, you know, in, in, uh, I was just with the uh, CEO of GE, uh, Vernova, uh, a new line in the old, you know, Thomas Edison plant in Schenectady, New York, opening up to build uh, 6.5 megawatt uh, uh, wind turbines. Uh, it's in, in in Michigan, uh, in uh, in Nevada, in Washington, in California. This is happening really across the country, and I think um, the more the more that is actually gets steel gets into the ground, structures are built, lines are come online, people are put to work. I think the more durable and more difficult it'll be. Uh, to pull it back. But in the near term, like with the ACA, we need to kind of keep fighting uh, and we need the support of people who believe uh, in, uh, in the agenda and who care about climate change to be in that fight with us and talking to their members of Congress and, and, uh, uh, and talking to their, you know, uh, and getting involved and engaged in, in uh, letting their uh, views and perspectives known. It's, it's interesting because um, in this conversation that we were having earlier today, you know, I think at least U.S. businesses are excited. This is a huge opportunity. And I keep hearing that word, you know, obviously to tossed around as everyone uses it, but um, it's a, it feels like that's part of the durability too, right, is the energizing of the actors who are going to be really taking advantage of this and the opportunities. And like you said, it's about ensuring that they're at the table, they're vocal, they're getting the message out that they're really benefiting from this. Um, I know that this is a, a lot of a private sector um, audience. Is there something specific that you would ask of the private sector at this moment um, to help with the implementation and future success. I mean, you've mentioned one, which is get out there and be vocal. Um, and um, you know, definitely, I believe a lot of people are ready to give feedback and and uh, you know be a part of the solution. But is there anything else that you think would be a, a call to action? Well, I you know I think that uh, there uh, there needs to be sort of uh, uh, a a collective argument for doing this for transforming the economy. And so, you know, I think that um, it, it, I was with Carol Browner this, uh, or also earlier this morning. We were talking about the fact that, you know, for years people gave us advice that, you know, just talk about clean energy, just talk about jobs. It's it's politically more neutral. It's easier to deal with. Don't talk about climate change. Well, people are feeling the effects of climate change, <laughs> you know, uh, in the heat in the Southwest and the floods in Vermont and New York and the fires in Maui all across the globe. Uh, the you know I can go on and on and talk about the disasters we've experienced this, just this summer. Uh, Ninety-eight percent of the world population experienced uh, uh, heightened uh, heat loads uh, from what their normal environment was was uh, uh, ex uh, experience experiencing. And I think that. While this is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous driver of economic growth, a tremendous driver of technological innovation, it's also a necessity, and we need to remind people of that. And I think business voices saying uh, there is a clean energy future. We're going to make this transformation. There is opportunity. Uh, American innovation has always proven the best in the world. Uh, we now have the conditions uh, through, again, the uh, the combination of getting extra credit, if you will, for making it here uh, is, you know, that, that story needs to be told in a larger context, I think, uh, in addition to the specific project that wouldn't have happened. I mean, I can't tell you the number of business executives that trooped through my office saying we would not have done this if the IRA had not passed. And so, that's important, but I think it, need, it also needs to fit into the larger story. And then I would say um, and, and, uh, that uh, they need to be uh, two other things. One is they need to level with their investors uh, their, and all of the constituents of, 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 the, of their companies. So I think 
uh, financial disclosure uh, is is a very important issue. Now we've just seen California move forward on that in the United States. The EU has already moved forward on it. So I think that uh, making sure that you're accurately accounting for uh, all of your emissions and and being and doing that with it, with fealty and integrity is, is important. And the last one, which I hope some of them will listen to me on, um, uh, respect the right to organize and let you and let workers uh, have a voice uh, in this future. In addition to paying uh, prevailing wages and paying decent wages, uh, give them a fair playing field, which is guar their guaranteed right. Uh, under our nation's labor laws. So whether they listen to me on that one, I don't know. But uh, I hope they do, because I think we'll go further, faster together uh, if people view this as a common project. Absolutely. So I know we're running close to time, but I have two quick questions for you. Okay. One, give us a sneak peek. What are we going to be seeing in the next days, weeks, months coming out of IRA, out of the White House, that we should be watching for? Oh, my God, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but stay tuned. Uh, we have a big announcement coming. Ali's going to do it tomorrow, and uh, I think you'll be excited by it. Uh, but I think, look, this is just a, uh, we're, we're, again, uh, on a, uh, a, a, an extremely historic pace to get information out and, and these grants made. But... Uh, stay tuned for Ali's announcement tomorrow. It's a good one. <laughs> Excellent. But I'm not going to front run it. In this audience. <laughs> Excellent. Then everyone will look out for that tomorrow. Um, and last question. I just I, I cannot help but ask this uh, of you. We've had um, some incredible speakers, former presidents, um, CEOs, uh, governors, um, and so I ask of you the same leadership question. Um, what, as a you know. A person with incredible experience can you share with us in terms of leadership and how to keep going at this really particularly uh, interesting moment? You know, that's a, a, a I take solace not from the uh, from the the challenges which are great, but really from the opportunity. You just have to seize it. You have to believe in it. You have to believe that uh, humankind has the capacity to meet the challenge, get the job done. Uh, and that's, I think, invigorating. You know, like, I'm an old man, so I'm still at this. And, I, and I'm at it with, with vigor, I think. I, at least I, I like to think so. I don't know. <laughs> Emma, who works with me, is there. She can, she can, she can uh, take the mic and debate, and, and <laughs> debate that. Uh, because I think it's exciting. It's, it's about building a, a more just, safer, and more sustainable world. Uh, and the alternative is disaster. So we just got to, we need to stay in the fight. I love it. Couldn't end on a better note. Thank you, John. Huge round of applause. And I'll just take a quick minute. And thank everybody. I know we're just closing up. Um, uh, just huge thanks for everybody for joining us in Energizing for America. Thank you, John, for being such an incredible speaker. Thank you to all of our panelists, speakers. We've had an incredible day really thinking about what the U.S. is really focusing on, what you all can do. And um, we look forward to working with you as we move forward um, and get a lot of amazing climate action done this week. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.